Good morning. Let me first thank the uh, Colombo University Alumni Association, uh, the FT, and the other organizers for inviting me to be here with you this morning. And I'd also like to welcome and thank our resource people uh, who've joined us from HSBC. Um, now, I'm sure you've heard a far more informed um, presentations about uh, ASEAN and the opportunity it presents uh, to Sri Lanka. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is to look at the title, ASEAN Sri Lanka's Next Big Opportunity, in two parts. Uh, basically to ask two uh, questions. One is, why is it important to take advantage of this opportunity? Um, and what do we need to do to um, make sure that these uh, advantages emanating from this opportunity materialize? And secondly, to share with you some rather tentative thoughts as to what the benefits are, uh, what constitutes this opportunity as far as ASEAN is concerned, or at least Sri Lanka's uh, relations, enhanced and deepened relations with uh, ASEAN uh, uh, can generate. So why is it important to take advantage of this opportunity? Um, I think those of you who heard me before would have heard me say this uh, several times. Uh, our growth strategy has to have exports and FDI as two key pillars. If you're a country with a population of 21 million, per purchasing power of 4,000 US dollars, clearly domestic demand can only take you so far. You certainly can't get five, six, 7% growth on a sustained basis, as the countries to the east of us have done, a number of countries to the east of us have done, by just focusing on domestic demand. So exports have to be part of the, uh, the growth narrative in a very integral way. Uh, that's one. Uh, and, and this is the case. If you look at, look at the successful countries in East and Southeast Asia, uh, whether they are as large as China uh, or as uh, small as Singapore, uh, export expansion has been a key part of their economic transformation. Um, and then, if you look at it, for, uh, one must say that Japan and Korea, South Korea, you have their separate. They, their uh, economic transformation was not driven quite as much by exports, but that happened at a separate time, uh, the pre kind of WTO world, and also, there were specific circumstances related to uh, the Marshall Plan at the end of the Second World War for Japan and the assistance Korea got after the Korean War. So those were separate set of circumstances. But if you look at all the other countries in Asia, as I say, as large as China or as small as Singapore, exports have played a key role in their uh, economic transformation. And also, if you look at the process of export transformation, FDI has played a key role. Again, the same. Biggest China, smallest Singapore, all the countries in between, FDI has played a very key role in uh, export transformation. So um, the opportunity of, 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 uh, which is offered by uh, greater uh, uh, deepening uh, of our relations with ASEAN countries uh, will help us to achieve this objective of putting in place a growth model that is uh, based on exports and FDI. So that is the basic rationale for saying that this is an opportunity. An opportunity because it will, as I go on, I hope you, I'll be able to convince you that this opportunity will help us to fulfill the requirements of this growth model that is uh, very much embedded in the government's 2025 uh, vision statement. I should also say, uh, before I move on from this particular segment of my remarks, uh, to share with you why I think our export performance has been so poor. Uh, our exports as a percent of GDP were 33%, uh, was 33% in 2000. It's come down to about 13% now. Our share of global exports was 0.086 uh, in 2000. It's come down to 0.064. 
We've gone backwards, and gone backwards significantly. And a large part of the explanatory uh, factors uh, relates to an anti-export bias in our policy framework. What do I mean by that? One, for much of the time over the last several years, and certainly over the last 10 years, uh, the exchange rate has been overvalued. An overvalued exchange rate clearly uh, acts as a disincentive for exports, not only for exports, but also for those who produce uh, import, um, sorry, yes, import competing goods. So um, for much of the time, if you look at it, uh, essentially we've been asking our exporters to run 110 meters in a 100 meter rate race, because the uh, real effective exchange rate has often been seven, 10% or more are uh, overvalued. So that's one. So the exchange rate has not been export friendly. Secondly, we have over the last 10, 12 years introduced a series of para tariffs. Effective protection has increased significantly. Now the thing about para tariffs is that it essentially excludes you from the most dynamic component of the international trading system. Over the last 10, 20 years, it is tra intra-firm trade in Asia that has been the most dynamic component of the international trading system. That is basically the value chains, the supply chains of Asian companies. Now, the, the, when, when you put paratariffs, you exclude yourself. So why do I say you exclude yourself? Because really in, in modern uh, production sharing systems, cross-border uh, value chains and production sharing systems, production sharing networks, the distinction between exports and imports gets significantly blurred. You need to bring stuff in, do your little bit in the production sharing network and get it out. If you stick para tariffs in the middle, you become uncompetitive. So basically, through all these para tariffs that we've introduced, we have excluded ourselves from that whole narrative of uh, the global uh, and regional production sharing networks. Uh, and that has been one of the main reasons why uh, our uh, export performance has been constrained. So ex in terms of the overall macroeconomic policy frameworks, two major constraints which have held back export expansion have been the exchange rate and these para tariffs. Of course, there are a number of institutional factors. Uh, there are a number of other factors which also have to come together, which I'll now get to, uh, to ensure that uh, exports uh, expand and that the FDI that you need to uh, support export expansion comes in. Now, if I say a little bit about FDI before I get on to the next segment of my remarks, uh, clearly, I mean, it helps us to uh, fill the savings investment gap, that is well known, uh, and it helps us to access markets, that is well known. Uh, but is, what is also well known, but was really brought home to me most recently uh, by some of the work uh, that Professor Ricardo Hausmann has done, uh, FDI gets you access to know-how. That is critical. To move to a more complex export basket, to diversify the export uh, basket, to make it complex so that we are able to create higher value employment because we are no longer a low uh, wage economy. So we need to create higher value employment. For that, we need a more complex uh, basket of exports and FDI plays an important role in moving to a more complex basket of exports. If you look at the export basket for Thailand around 1980 and ours, it's pretty much the same in terms of complexity. You look at it now, dramatically different. Thailand is way ahead. If you look at Vietnam, as late as probably just before the turn of the century, again, same place. You look at it now, Vietnam is way ahead. And FDI has been a crucial factor in helping those countries get a more complex uh, 
uh, and more diversified export basket. And in the process, they have also diversified their destinations in terms of exports, whereas ours is still over 50% goes to the US and, uh, and um, Europe. Uh, and we haven't really um, got enough new products, complex products, other than the ICT sector. I mean, garments is a relatively old story now. Um, and even the garments, we basically was not something that grew out of our policy framework. Uh, and uh, it wasn't a kind of natural organic development. The garment sector got going because of the multi-fiber agreement and the quotas that came with the multi-fiber agreement. That is not something that is going to be replicated in other sectors. So we got a big leg up from the quotas and then you got some FDI which came in, which worked with our local companies and now of course we have world-class companies. But that, that initial leg up of having quotas is not something we're going to get for other sectors today. So we have to create the li right policy environment, the right institutional support to boost our exports. And we need to get FDI in to support the process. Okay, so what are we doing to facilitate this in terms of export growth and, uh, and FDI uh, attraction? Now, when you are sitting in my seat, you, you have to talk about stability and, and uh, the macroeconomic uh, fundamentals. Uh, I, I'm sorry if uh, all of you have heard this before, but I feel that this is almost an article of faith that I have to go through. And so really, what is being done to improve the macroeconomic fundamentals of the country? Four frameworks are being put in. One, the main source of instability in the system for many years now has been the government's budgetary operations. So there is a, f a revenue enhancement based fiscal consolidation process that is currently underway. Uh, it's part of the uh, extended fund facility arrangement, but whether there is an extended fund facility or not, whether the IMF is here or not, this is something we have to do. We have to get our fiscal house in order because the excess demand that has been pumped into the system through the government's fiscal operations over the years has meant that we have been a high budget deficit, high inflation, high nominal interest rate, overvalued currency economy. Exactly, diametrically, 180 degrees the opposite of the successful countries of East and Southeast Asia, which ran disciplined budgets, had uh, low inflation, low um, uh, uh, and stable nominal interest rates, and a competitive and often undervalued currency. So we have done exactly the opposite, which is why we have fallen so far behind those successful countries of East and Southeast Asia. One of the reasons we have fallen behind. So we have to get the fiscal um, uh, house in order, and there it's encouraging, because for the first, second time since 1955, last year there was a primary surplus in the budget. And hopefully this year, we will have a current account surplus for the first time since 1987. So some of the structural problems in the budget are being addressed, and the VAT reforms played a major part. The tax administration, uh, improvements through the introduction of technology is another factor. And of course, from April 1st this year, hopefully, the new Inland Revenue Act will also help us to, one, uh, increase the revenue base, and two, to move towards a fairer uh, uh, tax system. Now, I see like, all of us are complaining that we have to pay more tax. We have 83% of our taxes collected through indirect taxes. When it comes to indirect taxes, the poorest man in Sri Lanka and the richest man in Sri Lanka pays the same rate. That is not the basis on which taxation should be effected. So we need to have a better outcome. We need to go to about a 60-40 uh, distribution between direct and indirect taxes. So those of us who can afford it, we have to pay our taxes. We get free education, we get free health. We, we as a people, seem to want Swedish social welfare and a Hong Kong tax rate. That does not add up. I'm sorry. It does not add up, okay? So I think really we need to change our mindset. And those of us who, I mean, I had free education only to the age of 12, but many of us have had free education. 
free university education. And then we can't say we don't want to pay tax. That just doesn't, in my, in my view, uh, uh, really make sense. And we really shouldn't be imposing this kind of burden uh, in terms of taxation on the poor and a poorer and more vulnerable segment of our uh, society. We have to change it. And the Indian Revenue Act tries to do that. And I hope some of the lobbying that's going on trying to undo it uh, will not be successful because it, it just is not fair. This is not a fair tax system. It's an extremely unfair tax system, and we must change it. Um, let me, um, so on the fiscal side, fiscal consolidation, revenue enhancement. This time you have to give me a red light, yeah, when I have to stop. Then uh, on, the, um, uh, on the monetary policy side, again a framework, the central bank is uh, introducing a, uh, a flexible inflation targeting regime, which I'm sure all of you are familiar about. We are making steady progress. Uh, we have an inflation target of 4 to 6 percent. We've upgraded the forecasting uh, and modeling capacity within the central bank. Uh, we are putting in place a legal and accountability framework to support flexible inflation targeting. Now, if you want a really robust accountability framework, the central bank governor should resign if he misses the target. So that's, that's the kind, I don't know whether we'll get quite that far, but that's, those are the kind of things we're putting in. And in putting in this um, uh, uh, legal framework, uh, there will be, uh, I hope, uh, that's the intention, and the cabinet has approved this, there will be greater independence for the central bank. And there will, of course, be more accountability that comes with that independence. Uh, then, if I may move to uh, uh, the exchange rate. We have moved to a more flexible management of the exchange rate. Um, in the past, we have tried to defend the rate uh, using uh, our scarce reserves. Uh, that's not something uh, we'll do because, as you all probably know, in 2011, 2012, I think we spent close to four billion US dollars trying to defend the rate and then depreciated by close to 15% anyway. In 2015, under this government, I think about almost two billion, I think, US dollars were spent and we depreciated by about 10%. So it, it's a double whammy. You know, you waste your reserves and then you depreciate the currency anyway. So that's not something we're going to do. But having said that, we are not going to allow undue volatility either. So let me say a little bit about the, what has been happening to the exchange rate. Uh, there have been certain allegations made that the central bank is contributing to the pressure on the exchange rate by purchasing dollars from the market. We've tried to explain it in a statement today. Uh, but let me, let me state certain principles. As, as far as we're concerned, uh, we do not see any cause for the pressure that there is in the uh, forex market. Clearly there are global developments, the strength of the dollar, uh, US interest rates normalizing, higher oil prices, all that creates a certain amount of pressure but not the extent of the pressure we have seen. Uh, why we say that is that in the first quarter of this year, the average monthly inflow into the forex market was two billion US dollars. In, that's in the first quarter. In April, it came down to 1.8 billion. And in May, it came down to 1.6 billion. So, but if you look at exports, if you look at remittances, you look at tourism, you look at all the other sectors, of course we haven't got the latest figures as yet, but there is no reason to believe that you should, there should have been a 20% reduction in the money coming into the forex market. That makes us think there's speculation going on. And really that is not something the central bank will tolerate. Because one, as I said, we are trying to give a competitive exchange rate. The real effective exchange rate is around 100. Reserves are at 9 billion, and with the Hambantota money that's due sometime this week, and another billion that's coming in on a syndicated loan, reserves are at historically very, very high levels. So there is no reason for this undue pressure on the exchange rate. And there's no reason why this, there should be this fall in the amount of money coming into the forex market. And those, if anybody is speculating, I must tell you that's not something we will tolerate for any length of time. And also it is really not helpful 
in the long run, in the enlightened self-interest of those who operate in the forex market, we have a lot of instruments we can use to restrict banks, to restrict importers, to restrict exporters. If you want to know what those measures are, please look at what my former mentor, Ms. A.S. Jawadna, who passed away recently, did in 2001. Just look and see what he did in 2001 when the currency overshot. Look at the powerful instrument we have to restrict the market. We do not want to do it. Let me repeat that. We do not want to do it. It's not good for the market. It's not good for importers. It's not good for exporters. It's not good for the economy. But if people, people speculate and impose an undue burden on the people of this country, I say that because there's a very high import component in the basic consumption bundle in this country. We are not going to allow people to speculate and impose an undue burden on the people of this country. So please, there is no reason for this kind of pressure, and we will, if necessary, use all the instruments we have to discipline the market. But we want to develop the market. In fact, recent, very soon, we will be announcing further measures to develop the exchange, foreign exchange market. We want to give the market a competitive exchange rate. We do not want to intervene in the market. We want people to be, behave responsibly and to run the market uh, in a responsible way. But we cannot, given the fact that there is such a high import component in our basic consumption bundle, to allow speculation to drive the rupee to a weaker position than it should be. And, and we have the instruments to stop that, but they are suboptimal options. They are not good for the market, and we don't want to use them but at the same time, we need responsible behavior within the forex market to help us to develop the market and to let the market operate in the way it should. So that's foreign exchange. Uh, and and we, are kind of, we will be announcing a certain framework, parameters within which we will manage the exchange rate. We are working on that uh, with the assistance of the IMF and, and that, that uh, will be uh, made clear in due course. Finally, the final framework is the um, liability management. Uh, as you know, the uh, Active Liability Management Act uh, was passed uh, by Parliament in April, and that gives us greater headroom and flexibility to manage our external obligations, the bunching of our external obligations that is coming up ahead of us. Uh, and uh, certainly in the Q&A, because I'm running out of time, I'm happy to uh, expand further on this, but colleagues in the central bank are working out a medium-term debt management strategy, and within that, a liability management strategy, and we will uh, make that available so people will know exactly how we are proposing to manage uh, this bunching of external debt that is ahead of us. Provided fiscal discipline is maintained, we are pretty confident that we can manage uh, the, the, the manage our external obligation. Sri Lanka has never ever missed a single external payment uh, and uh, we are confident that provided this fiscal discipline is maintained, uh, we will not be missing any payments uh, in the future either. Uh, so those are the four frameworks that are being put in place in terms of macro stability um, because what I'm trying to say here is that, okay, if, uh, uh, you know, essentially, as far as access to greater access to ASEAN is concerned, it will help us to achieve this growth model that we are trying to put in place. Uh, but also that we, you know, you, we, you, we won't benefit unless we increase supplies of goods and services. So to sub increase supplies of goods and services, you have to have sound macro fundamentals, which is why we are putting in place those frameworks. In addition, we have to strengthen the growth framework. And for that, uh, we need to strengthen our factor markets, land, labor, and, and, and capital. And there, again, the Vision 2025 document has some uh, good proposals, uh, which the government is working its way through. One could argue that it's far too slow, but at least the direction of travel is positive. Uh, on top of that, uh, uh, there is work being done to improve the uh, investment climate. Uh, the Board of Investment um, has set up, I think, what they call the SWIFT. What is it? It is the uh, Single Window Investment 
what is it? I don't know what the F and T facility, I don't know what the T is. But anyway, there is a, there is a, it's called SWIFT. It's a single window uh, facility uh, in the Board of Investment. And we've been working on it for a long time, but there are signs that it is now coming together. And the Board of Investment is also being much more focused. It's worked with the Harvard uh, Center for International Development to have a much more focused approach to uh, uh, investment promotion. They've identified certain sectors and they've, they've, uh, they're going to attract anchor investors into those sectors. Equally, the Export Development Board has, I think, identified six uh, focus areas and four pillars of support. So all these things have been worked out and now need to be implemented. As far as the short term, uh, so that's, that's, sorry, that's investment and investment promotion. Trade facilitation, the single electronic window in customs, I think is very close to being operational. Uh, the Commerce Department has produced a, a portal to address the information asymmetry that constrains exporters. Um, but potentially the jewel in the crown are these trade agreements. Uh, before coming to ASEAN, let me talk a little bit about trade agreements in general. Um, the government, I know he's under a lot of cr uh, criticism for these, uh, but I think it's important to say that there is a trade policy statement. Often I've read that people, people say that there is, the government doesn't have a, a trade policy. But there is actually a 25, 30 page document, uh, which is the government's trade policy statement, which in my view is well written, well argued. So there is actually a trade policy statement. Also, in order to create uh, conditions which give greater um, comfort and support to the domestic uh, enterprises, the government has passed the anti-dumping bill anti-dumping and countervailing duties bill. It has passed the safeguards provisions bill. All these things are essentially intended to give greater comfort and support to domestic industry as some trade liberalization takes place as the trade agreements are signed. Uh, and also there is a trade adjustment package that's being worked out with the support of the World Bank and the, I think the uh, International Trade Center and European Union, which gives support to domestic uh, industries to become more competitive. So the, the, on these uh, uh, trade agreements, if we are successful in signing a trade agreement with China, uh, we are in the process of deepening and widening the one in, with India, and we have GSP plus with Europe. I do not know of any other country in ASEAN or anywhere else which has preferential access to China, India, and Europe. I don't, I don't think anybody else has preferential access to all three of those uh, large and lucrative markets. So you take that with our location 20 miles from the largest going fast economy, India. We are slap bang in the middle of the, the, the maritime uh, Silk Road uh, of the Chinese. Uh, we have easy access to the Middle East, to East Africa. We are equidistant between Europe and, and the Far East. You take the locational advantages and then you put in place this preferential access to a market of more than three billion people in China, India, uh, uh, Pakistan, Europe, uh, and now Singapore, uh, you clearly have a real opportunity to leverage the trade investment nexus. You show that preferential access, you show the location, and you get investors to come here and locate and produce. And if we can create the macro fundamentals, if we can have political, some, some degree of political stability, uh, and we uh, have this uh, kind of uh, trade policy, clearly that is a, a massive differentiator. So let me, uh, also the government is doing a couple of things in terms of quick, a quick boost to growth. The Gamperelia scheme essentially has the minor tank rehabilitation. Uh, way back in the 1980s, uh, when, uh, 19, late 70s, early 80s, when the accelerated Mahabali scheme was being considered, I remember I was seconded from the central bank to the finance ministry, and the World Bank told us, you know, rather than doing the Mahabali scheme, you should really do minor tank irrigation. You have over 20,000 of those. You rehabilitate those, you will have a much higher return than the Mahabali scheme. Now, whether that is true or not, I don't know. The World Bank told the 
South Koreans not to go into shipping and, and they became the world's biggest shipbuilder. But, so they don't always get it right. Uh, but but uh, I, you know, what, the point I'm making is there is a massive return, a very high return to rehabilitating minor tanks. Uh, because in the, in the kind of rehabilitation process, you create employment, uh, you get water uh, for households and, 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 and for, uh, for ir uh, irrigation, you can have inland fisheries. There are so many things that come up with minor tank, uh, rehabilitation of minor tanks. So that is one. The government is having a program to rehabilitate these 22,000 uh, uh, minor irrigation tanks. Secondly, rural roads, and thirdly, uh, rural pullers, and fourthly, the agricultural supply chain. So in the next 18 months, high priority is going to be given to what this is called the Gumperalia program, they're calling it, and about 80,000, uh, um, sorry, 80 billion, billion, somebody said 80 million the other day, but uh, they probably misheard me, 80 billion rupees have been allocated over the next two years for this uh, rural uh, development program. In addition, there is the Enterprise Sri Lanka program, which is really intended to focus upon SMEs, um, whereby uh, concessional credit will be available. Finally, let me get to the real subject now, which is, <laughs> is ASEAN an opportunity? How can, we, how can we take advantage of it? Let me start with the um, Singapore, Sri Lanka-Singapore uh, free trade agreement. Um, now, uh, there are lots of people here who know much more about this than I do. But for me, uh, you know, we, the most interesting part of it, I don't think we are going to be exporting large amounts to Singapore. I don't see that as a possibility. But the real advantages are one investment, Singaporean investment in here, because the agreement now pro provides even greater uh, uh, security in terms of a framework for Singaporean investment in this country. And the second interesting chapter, for me anyway, is the e-commerce chapter. Uh, to basically use uh, entry into Singapore as a platform to do e-commerce in the whole ASEAN region. So I think those are probably the two biggest potential gainers from the, uh, the Singaporean FTA, in addition to whatever we can get by way of training uh, it's, and uh, transfer of know-how. Now, one of the, uh, the, the criticisms of the agreement has been uh, this concern that there will be a flood of professionals. Now, I do have some difficulty with this. I have read the agreement. I do not see any provision in the agreement which allows for this. And those who criticize the agreement, to my knowledge, have not cited a provision in the agreement which allows this. People say people are going to flood in. Okay, what is there in the agreement that's going to allow people to come in? I haven't seen it. And so what is important is, of course, people can criticize things, and they have every right to do so, and they should. These are important things. We have to get it right. But it, you know, criticism must be founded on facts. You know, you, you can't just make wild allegations. If there is something in the, uh, in the agreement which enables the flooding in of professionals, then that should be pointed out. You can say this provision in the, in the agreement is going to allow professionals to flood in. And if that is the case, we should think about it. But just to say that professionals are going to flood in and not cite something in the act which is going to allow it, I don't think that's objective. You know, these are very important things which can be of potential advantage to the country. So we must put emotion to one side. We have to be objective. We have to be data-driven. And we have to basically look at the facts and get the best deal for the country. And not allow um, emotion to get in, uh, in the way and drag us down, as it has done for 70 years now. We need to be far more professional and far more objective in the way we assess the benefits and costs of various public policy decisions. By all means, there should be criticism, but it should be based on facts. Um, so that's, that's the Singapore agreement. And now, uh, let me, what, taking ASEAN as a whole, I'm sure you've heard from other speakers, 
you know, that, that it's the seventh largest economy in the world. It'll be the fourth largest by 2050. Um, it's, a, it's a, I think, a 2.6 trillion or more economy with 630 million people, the third largest um, labor force. So all that is there as an opportunity uh, if one is to engage with ASEAN. So what, is, what are the specific things that we can do? Uh, I think two things come to mind. One is essentially, what are the value chains we can plug into within the ASEAN region? ASEAN, of course, is not a monolithic entity. You've got Singapore at one end, and you've got uh, uh, Myanmar, uh, Laos, and Cambodia at the other end. Uh, but we need to see whether, with our locational advantages and our preferential trade advantages, whether we can attract Singaporean investment in here, um, Malaysian investment in here, uh, Thai investment, and in Indonesian uh, investment from ASEAN to help us to plug into value chains. Uh, value chains both in the manufacturing sector, also value chains in the services and logistics sectors. So that's, that's one opportunity. Uh, the second is, if you look at the countries of East and Southeast Asia, a key determinant of their economic transformation has been their capacity to adopt and adapt technology. So I think another real opportunity as far as deepening our engagement with ASEAN is to see whether we can get joint ventures to enable us to adopt and adapt technology and to upgrade our industrial capacity, our logistical capacity, uh, and our services capacity. So those are, I think, two clear opportunities we need to explore. Uh, and there are a number of sectors in terms of the value chains. Uh, some of the sectors that have been, been identified include electronics and components, machinery and parts, transport equipment and parts, um, textiles, as well as uh, uh, you know, finance, uh, financial services, including fintech, uh, where, of course, Singapore is very much a leader. So these are all opportunities that, that, that exist. Then fi my final point about uh, why ASEAN is an opportunity is that the countries in ASEAN are, are middle level uh, powers. So you don't get the baggage of the major powers of the Chinas, the Indias, uh, or the, the US or whatever, because when the major powers come in here, given that the Indian Ocean, uh, the, the strategic dynamics of the Indian Ocean region have changed. Uh, everybody has become interested in us. Uh, but if you, and if you get China in here, if you get India in here, if you get the US in here, somebody is going to get worried about it. But if you bring ASEAN in here, I don't think anybody is going to get worried about it. So that is one advantage of deepening and uh, uh, widening our relationship with ASEAN countries, uh, because from a geopolitical point of view, uh, it is far more neutral. Uh, there isn't as much baggage. Uh, so that's another significant advantage that ASEAN gives you. So if I can end, I, let me say that uh, Sri Lanka has an opportunity in general. We have to get our macro side right. We have to get our growth framework right. The plans are in place, but we're implementing far too slowly. That needs to improve. And if you look at what ASEAN has to offer, it fits in with our priorities. It fits in with our export um, strategy, our FDI strategy. It fits in with our, our, our non-aligned uh, uh, international relations strategy, um, and of course, uh, it has strong locational advantages given the fact that they are uh, very much within the region. Thank you all very much.